Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 11 is the section of scripture that I'd like to study with you this morning. I'd like to start by simply saying something that I think all of us would probably agree with and that is that we are rich, aren't we? When we take into account uh, the freedoms we enjoy and uh, strength and uh, opportunities for fellowship and teaching and, uh, and, and encouragement, when we look around us and compare ourselves to the, to the plight of people in Ethiopia and, and, and in less free countries of the world, um, I think we have to uh, agree that we are very rich. And the unfortunate thing that uh, Paul was finding it necessary to deal with the Christians here at Galatia was that they, like us, were free, but they were turning back into poverty. They were turning their back on their riches and, and doing what the, uh, the prince did in that uh, famous story about the prince and the pauper. Uh, he wanted to get out of the palace for a while and enjoy um, what he saw his friends doing, or at least the neighborhood kids that didn't have anything. Uh, he wanted to trade places with them and enjoy what they had. And it wasn't long before he, uh, he he turned back and went back to the palace, as the story goes. Uh, there is this contrast in the first 11 verses of Galatians chapter 4. There are two themes here that Paul is weaving together to, uh, to try to correct this wrong um, turn of events in the lives of the Galatian Christians. One theme is the time element, that he is comparing the past to the present and he's going to take this change and apply it to the lives of the Christians to whom he was writing and this personally applies to every one of us in this room I, I believe this morning we all have a past and we all are now living in the present and the contrast that Paul draw, drew for those Christians I really do believe applies to us because at one time we were paupers we were slaves to sin we were without God and separated from the righteousness of Christ, without God and without hope in the world. And when Jesus Christ came into our lives, God's word emphatically declares that we become rich. We become heirs of God with Jesus Christ to all the wonderful spiritual blessings in heavenly places which someday are going to be more than merely spiritual. They're, we're, they're going to be personal inheritance, personal possessions that we're physically going to enter into. The other theme that Paul connects to this contrast between past and present throughout this passage is character roles. He actually talks about slaves. He actually talks about a son becoming an heir. He actually talks about tutors and governors and lords. And, uh, and he's showing by his use of terminology, he's using a picture here to show a position that a person has before to that which we now have. It's quite similar to what we looked at last Sunday morning in the third chapter of Galatians, but there's a subtle difference, and I, I think it's important to see the difference between the two illustrations that Paul is teaching with between the end of Galatians chapter 3 and the first part of chapter 4. Last week, the contrast that Paul was drawing was between an individual who was going to school and at some point enters into society as a mature son of their parents and enter into a, um, a, a full role as a, as a mature son um, who had gone through his education and, and now was a functioning member of society. And Paul was using that sort of situation that, that all the Galatians were familiar with in their day and time. They had grown up this way. Uh, for years they had been um, under tutors and governors and, and had gone to school under their father's slave to look after them. But at a certain point, they became functioning members in their father's business. This is the way it worked. And uh, that is the illustration that Paul uses to show, listen, the law was like our schoolmaster and we no longer live under law. We're mature sons of God. We've been begotten into his family by adoption. We belong to him and we have all the full rights and privileges that any mature son in society has. We have all that God has to offer us. And since we now are mature sons, we are beginning to inherit the promises. We are now heirs. Now, 
That was last week's picture. This week's picture that he's using in these first 11 verses is similar. And uh, before I go any further, I think that the illustration, as he gives it in the first two verses, adequately explains it. So let's read the first two verses, and then we'll see his, the lesson that he draws from this illustration in verses 3 to 11. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors, under the time appointed of the father. Now, the illustration that Paul is drawing here this, in, in the passage that we're looking at this morning is not based on education. It involves some of the same character roles, but the point that he's drawing is the difference between an infant heir and a mature heir. That is the difference that he's drawing. He's, he's drawing the difference between a child, a babe in arms, who may be uh, like... Uh, Harold and what's uh, Princess Diana's other baby's name? Their oldest one is Harold, or their youngest one is Harold. What was the first one? Will William? Yeah, William and Harry. Okay, those two childs are infants in arms right now, and the eldest, I think it's William, is uh, someday, or he is even now, as a babe in arms, the heir apparent to the throne of England through his father. Right? But there's a vast difference between that baby now and that young man whenever the the situation arises where he may enter into all the legal rights that his father is just about ready to enter in as soon as his mother kicks off I should maybe talk that way <laughs> but uh, that's the, that's that's what it happens he doesn't he, he even Prince Charles is the uh, is not yet the King of England he is the heir to the throne and uh, we'll have to delete that, Jerry. And, uh, and so this is the illustration that, uh, that Paul is using. Um, he's saying in verse 1 that, uh, that the heir to a father's inheritance, when he's a baby, is really no difference than, different than, than any other baby in the household, even if it's an adopted slave's child. Uh, a baby is a baby. Regardless, you know, they still have to, you have to teach them to eat, you have to teach them to everything about life. And, um, and, and the emphasis here is, differs nothing from a servant. There was a point, Paul is going to draw this, so maybe I shouldn't jump into it yet. But he's going to show that we, before we became Christians, in one sense, were like these babies. We were no different than anybody else. And now he goes on and says, how we were no different. In verse 2 he says, but was under tutors and governors. That is, everybody in their babyhood is subject to higher authorities. And he's going to draw this parallel out that in our life, prior to being Christians, that we were subject to higher authorities. And he's going to tell us exactly what those authorities were. And the, and, the, and the parallels are just precise that Paul is using in this illustration. And there's two implications from what Paul has given to us here that are very important for us to note. The first implication is that there are two definite, very distinct periods of time built into this illustration. Because Paul has said that he, is, he has described a napios, an infant, a child, in that period of time, and then he uh, refers in verse 2 to the time appointed of the Father. Now this time appointed of the Father is, is something that uh, perhaps, well, it's what I referred to, that uh, upon uh, Prince Charles' mother's death, he will then and only then come into full legal um, possession of the throne of England. This, in the Greek, the word is prothesmios. It refers to the father's legal right to fix the day when his son would come of age for the purpose of inheriting his father's property. And so, in that culture, even if the child was 14 or 16 or 17, it was up to the father to set the precise moment when that infant, in that period of time, would cross the border into a new time in his life. 
And it's a and and this the emphasis here in Paul's illustration is upon this prothesmios, this appointed time. That's the way it's translated. Until the time appointed of the Father. Again, Paul is going to draw a precise parallel to our Christian experience upon this illustration. A child is a child in this period of his life. And he has certain relationships to other people. There comes a point in time when all of that changes. And the implication is, is that there is a following, a subsequent period of time when there are new relationships. And Paul is going to really emphasize in his application and teaching about Christianity this, this change, this point in, of time that produced this change in which we are now living. And so the other thing that is implied in this illustration is two differing positions. The child has differing relationships prior to that set time of the father than he has after that set time of the father. And Paul is going to draw these parallels. And so we start with verse 3. And through verse 11, Paul is going to do two things. He's going to compare in the first section, verses 3 to 7, the Christian's present and former position. He's going to show that just like that child, we now have a different position than we once had. And the second contrast in verses 8 to 11, he shows a contrast in the practice or the behavior of the Christian now to the past. And he's really going to use it and turn it back on the Galatian Christians and says, you people are like princes going back and jumping into the... To the old, to, into the pauper's shoes. You're going to, you're acting as if you're giving up your inheritance and going right back, as if you were babies, infants, not knowing what you're doing. And, uh, and and there's a real parallel here. So let's look at three to seven, which is the first contrast. He is contrasting our position now to the past. Even so, we and I, I want you to notice the precise train of thought here. I'm not making this up. Paul says, even so, we. He's making the illustration to fit Christian experience. When we were children, and for the first time in the book of Galatians, he uses a different word for child. In verse 1, the word is napios, an infant in arms, and, and he uses the same word in the plural here, and he's just making a direct parallel. Listen, Christians, we are like infinite, when we were infants in arms, this is our position. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. This is our position. We were under a certain kind of authority. And what is that authority? He's not talking about people. He's making a spiritual parallel here. He's saying that as spiritual infants, that is, babes that weren't even saved, uh, and he's not describing Christians here. He says, beforehand, before we even came into the Father's household, we were like babies, and we were in bondage, just like a slave. We were no different than slaves. We were like like uh, like an unsaved person. All there is no difference, regardless of re if you're religious, like these Christ these people were prior to their salvation. They were very religious Jews. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or irreligious whether pagan or refined or cultured or churched, regardless, Paul says, when, that is like being a child and being no different than a slave because all of those people are under the bondage of the elements of the world. The elements of the world, what's that? Well, the Greek word for elements is stoicheia. And uh, bear with me here, I'll give you a definition of this word. Stoicheia is defined as... Um, a number of things in a row, right? Sometimes this word has been translated by Bible translators as the ABCs. Just like the alphabet has a number of things in a row, like and, and in, a, in a chronological order, one builds on the other. Some people take this to refer to the alphabet, right? To the alphabet of the world. But I, but then, if we extend that one step further. Stoike also has the idea of elementary religious principles, stages of religious experience. You and I have probably met people or heard testimonies of people that all through their lives they were searching for God and they went from this to this to this to another thing 
You see? And this is the kind of thing that Paul is describing here. We were under the elements, the different religious stages of a religious experience, going from one thing to the next, building on this experience and then thinking we've finally found something higher and better and going from that after we were disillusioned to something different even. I've heard people say they went from this religion to Rosicrucianism to this to Eastern religion and finally they found Christ. And Christ is not of the world, he's of the Father. So they finally went from out under bondage of the elements of the world to Christ. See, the elements of the world. If you just hold your finger here, uh, and there's a good cross-reference in the book of Colossians to this, the elements of the world. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, and verse 20. Similar problem in Colossae. Paul was correcting that. As you Christians have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, notice this next phrase, after the rudiments, that's exactly what is translated elements in, back in Galatians chapter 4, after the rudiments, the stoicheia of the world, and not after Christ. There's a there's a vast difference between them. Verse 20, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments, the stoicheia of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to these very ordinances? You see what those people were doing? They were subjecting themselves to the, the world's philosophies, its way of thinking, its, its manner of, of knowledge, and, and its principles and procedures. I even... Uh, one commentator even made a, a parallel to uh, the signs of the Zodiac. Um, the Stoike, in, in, as far as Greek religion, was based on mythology. And of course, if you know anything about Greek mythology, the stars had a great place, right? And, uh, and if you take this parallel to today, uh, notice the phenomenal interest today in the signs of the Zodiac, in uh, horoscopes and um, astrology. And, uh, and you see that this is not far-fetched. What the Galatian people were doing is something that is just, um, it's almost like a characteristic of our day and time in which we live. The world's elements. They could even be translated elemental spirits of the world. And so, if we just make this point here, Paul is saying this was our past position in verse 3. This is the former position that Christians were in just like a napios, a, an ignorant baby in bondage to higher forces. What, what are the forces to which a baby is subject? Parents. He's even subject to his own limitations more than, than we even are, are, are subject to as adults. You know, he can't control his muscles, right? So he, he is very limited. He is very much in bondage. And, and, and that is similar to, it, it's the parallel. People in the world without Christ are in bondage to the world's teachings. Now in verse 7, which is the last verse in this first section, I just want you to notice the vast difference. That was the former position of, Christ, of people before Christ. And in verse 7 he says, Wherefore you are no more a servant or slave, a doulos, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. No more a servant. You can't get a greater contrast. He says, we once were children in bondage, and he says, but now we are. Present tense, change in tense from past to present, we now are no more slaves subject to those former things. Our position is different, but we are sons. And if sons, heirs. Okay, now Paul uses a different word for son here. It's the same word for son that he used in the illustration in chapter 3. Huios, or huioi in the plural, which refers to mature, dignified, uh, the position, the mature position of a Christian in the father's home. Now, how did this change take place? And this is... In our illustration, remember, there's two periods of time and two positions in which 
Paul is saying a, a child would move throughout its experience from being an infant to being a mature son, to being an heir and the father, to enter, entering into the, uh, the inheritance. Okay, now what was the thing that moved that child from this position to this position? Was it not the appointed time of the father? Go back to the last part of verse 2. Until the time appointed of the father. Okay. Now this is what Paul is going to emphasize with real force here in verses 4, 5, and 6. He's going to show us three stages involved in this time appointed of the father, God the father. That he, just like an earthly father would do for his infant son, God the father does for us his spiritual children who were formerly subject to sin and Satan and the flesh and the world, and God intervenes at a, intervened at a set point in time in our lives and moved us to this new position. Stage one is seen in verse four. God's, when the fullness of time was come. See, see the parallel? When the fullness of time was come, God set the time. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, Verse 5, stage 2, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Stage 3, verse 6, and, and because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The word sent forth is found both in verse 5 and in verse 6. And it shows that God is sovereign in this respect. You and I have no right and no possible possible uh, opportunity to to make a, to move ourselves from slavery to to being an heir of God and unsaved people are, are described in the scriptures as being in a hopeless position they're they're taken captive by the devil at his will they're they're in subject they're subject and in, in bondage to him and so it is God that reaches in and, and changes things and uh, the three stages, um, you, could, you could picture if, if we were to expand the illustration in verses 1 and 2, which Paul didn't. You could almost picture the father uh, on this particular date, the set date when he, they would enact the ceremony in which the son would now become a full heir to his father's inheritance. You can picture the father sending a, an individual to go get his son right, and to bring his son to the father from outside or something. So that's stage one. The father sends an envoy to do something to, to change the status of this child. So he sends an envoy to get him. And that's Christ, basically what Christ did. Christ was sent by the father and uh, he was sent under that period of time. See, up until the actual legal act where the paper is signed was signed in, in these acts when, when these ceremonies were performed until the paper was signed that child up until that point was still in his former position Christ came while the world the entire world was in that position of being under the law in bondage to the elements of the world there's a parallel there. and and then he brought us to the legal act and that's alluded to in verse 5 that we might receive the adoption of sons the legal act is uh, the word for it is uh, is we are thesios, the adoption of sons. It's the same word that's used in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, that God accepts us in the beloved and, and adopts us into his house. So God does something that we can't affect ourselves. We can't make ourselves a member of somebody else's family. They have the choice to do that, even down here in an adoption agency. It's not the child that, that, uh, that runs the process, is it? It's the, it's the parents that want that child. And it's the father that's in control. He's sovereignly control. Okay. And then the third stage is that now that the child is in a new position, he's a son, now he has the right to call the father Abba, which is Aramaic for, for father, daddy. Right? It's a, it's a term of endearment. One commentator even suggests that sometimes... Um, rich people that didn't have their own children would adopt even a slave, a faithful slave, into the position of an adopted son in the family. And that this word Ava was some 
it was quite possibly used as as a seal that was spoken by the slave once the legal matter was settled that now he had the right to call his former master dad you see and you can see the parallels to our experiences as Christians at the moment of salvation God sent his son to make it possible for this to happen right and then at a point in time he redeemed us that is at a point of salvation he actually made us his own see we're no longer in that former state of bondage we've been set free from that we belong to him now and now we have the right to this intimate personal relationship with with the father through Jesus Christ and the spirit according to and a perfect parallel here is Romans chapter 8 verses 14 to 17 that uh, as many as are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God and we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father and we have been made joint heirs with Jesus Christ only a son in somebody's family can be an heir formerly we were slaves not sons now we are sons and therefore because of this new position we can inherit all that God has for us it's a marvelous parallel in this illustration the only thing I'd like to say before we leave this section is that just as in the past God had a specified time to change us from a former position to the position we now enjoy at the fullness of time God sent forth his son so God has already declared in his word that the position we now have as sons is going to be different from a future position that we are going to have we're still going to be sons but we're actually right now we're waiting sons and then we're going to be enjoying sons and there and Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 says that just as Christ came the first time he's there's appointed a date where he's going to come the second time unto salvation he's going to move us from this position to another and so uh, that is our hope and God is in sovereign control Ephesians 1 10 talks about the fullness of, of the dispensation of the fullness of time when God is going to finish his entire program and this is what faith is all about when we believe what God says he's going to do now before we really run out of time I want to go on to the last three or four verses here because this is the second contrast and this is the whole reason Paul has even used this illustration and said what he said up to this point big deal so we've got a new position okay so what does that mean now we're sons and heirs so what does that mean we're no longer slaves so what does that mean okay read carefully verses 8 and 9 and 10 Paul is contrasting practice nevertheless then notice the time element when you did not know God you did service unto them which by nature are no gods in other words Christians before we were saved we were in bondage that was our position and in practice we we were in, we did service to people and things that were our lords and masters but they by nature they weren't sovereign god you see that's paul's point it doesn't matter whether you are a member of the roman catholic religion or the jewish religion or mohammedism or any other cult the people that were your religious masters were not god by their very nature they were limited finite can't be any stronger put right now verse 9 the contrast but now after you have known God our present position and or rather are known by God because God knows his sheep the passage that uh, you referred to this morning Vince that God Christ knows his sheep and knows them by name since God knows us how do we turn again to the weak and the beggarly elements a reference back is actually the word still okay again how come we go back and act like we want to be under bondage again how come we want to go back and be subservient and put ourselves under those old lords and masters whether it be lusts of the flesh or actual other religious leaders and and and, and pastimes and, and philosophies and, and situations institutions why do we want to put ourselves back into that old system and that's precisely what the Galatian Christians were doing they were being at reconverts and I really you know we haven't done justice to this but I, there's a very important point here that we're going to make in conclusion that is this 
that just like you and I were converted at the moment of salvation, that is, we went from this position, completely changed direction to a new position, just as we were converted once, the Bible actually uses the same word that it's possible for Christians to be unconverted. I do not mean unsaved. I mean changed and going back in the old direction, even though we are members of God's family. That's the illustration that Paul is using. He doesn't say you people have ceased to become sons, does he? He doesn't say you are no longer heirs, does he? But he says, you people are princes and you're turning back and you're reconverting and you're going the wrong direction and you're acting, you're, you're putting yourself in voluntary bondage to these old things. And the illustration that he uses in verse 10, we could elaborate upon. You are going back and yielding to these old observances, days, months, times, years. Let me make a point. Did you know that Christianity has lowered itself to the, to the position now that there are a lot of people that are preaching the gospel to unsaved people and are saying, you don't really need to be converted. Quote, if Catholics step forward, there will be no attempt to convert them and their names will be given to the Catholic Church nearest their homes. This statement of the policy, which was to be followed by the Vancouver Graham Crusade, was attributed to Reverend David Klein of Brighouse United Church, a vice chairman of the organizing committee of the Billy Graham Crusade of British Columbia, as reported in the Vancouver Sun for October 5, 1984. Can you imagine preaching the gospel to unsaved people and saying, you don't have to change, just go back to your old church? That's diametrically opposed to what Paul was teaching here in this passage. He says that before we were saved, God sent his son to change us and to make us sons. And Paul is lamenting the fact that Christians now, these sons of God were acting like the, old, like, like the Jews that they had been before. Another illustration. In uh, December 1983, Good News Broadcaster, page 18. Born-again Christian Larry Flint now says he is an atheist. Several years ago, Flint's conversion, quote-unquote, to Christianity received nationwide publicity. The late Mrs. Ruth Carter Stapleton, that's Jimmy Carter's sister, was given credit for many evangelicals, by many evangelicals, for the sensational conversion of the porno king. At that time, however, some of the statements made by, quote-unquote, born-again Flint still opposed the Christ of Holy Scripture. Flint insists that he was sincere at the time, but admits now that he has lost his enthusiasm for life and has become an atheist. There's an example of a person, I don't believe, that was ever born again in the first place, right? but has gone back. Also, same article, Bob Dylan, who left Judaism and says he became a born-again Christian, quote-unquote, has again become a Jew. Okay. You shouldn't just jump on the bandwagon, hip, hip, hooray, and, and say, hey, this person, you know, has got Christian lyrics in their song. Look at their life. You see. And use it as an illustration. You know, it is possible for a person to make all kinds of profession and to use Christian terminology and say, I'm born again or I've been converted and go right back in the pig pen from whence they came. Now, the Lord knows and I don't, if those guys are really born again. That is not the issue. The issue is, be careful, because it's possible to turn back like a dog returns to its vomit. That's the illustration that Peter uses in Second Peter chapter 2. It's possible to take a pig out of the pig pen outside, or scrub them all up nice and pink, and put a ribbon around their neck, but a pig is a pig. And a pig is going to go back in the mud if you give it a chance. See, its real nature hasn't been changed. And 1 Timothy chapter 5 warns Christians uh, against reconverting to the world and to satanic doctrine. An article here by a fellow by the name of um, Bob Parks says, it is fairly common these days to learn that a Christian has been added to the casualty casualty list. You've heard the reports as I have. 
the prominent professing Christian leader who suddenly declares after years of apparent success in marriage and community and ministry he is seeking a divorce to marry another or to find himself. Or the vibrant young professing Christian who announces that she is leaving her evangelical church to join an extremist cult. Or the Christian businessman who is indicted for illegal business practices. Or the respected Christian who falls into immorality, injuring his family and his Christian testimony. And this guy, in this is an excellent article, he gives three things to help us uh, guard ourselves against doing what these Christians had done and, uh, and, and to prepare ourselves so that we will not convert, that is, turn around and go back in the direction that we came from. Right? And if you want to know what they are, read the article. We're out of time. Right? Paul hasn't given the solution here. He's lamenting the problem. Part of the solution for us is to realize from whence we came and who we are and to act accordingly. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace upon our lives. Without Christ, we would be without hope. And with Christ, Lord, help us to realize that we have all power and strength to overcome the flesh and the world and the devil. And help us to act like the high and lifted up sons that we are.